Hello and welcome to the Business of Data show. Today we will be talking with Lisa Allen from the Ordnance Survey, Russell Barker from Morgan Stanley and Nina Monkton from AXA Health. Hello there, my name's Catherine and I'm the Content and Community Manager here within the Business of Data team at Cranium. It's a pleasure to have you joining us today. Driven by our global connected network, Cranium inspires data and analytics senior leaders to drive efficiency and innovation and follow proven paths to success. The Business of Data show is just one of the many formats that we showcase thought leading insights from senior data and analytics executives. In each episode, we'll discuss the latest industry news and research and explore the hottest topics, challenges and opportunities. And on that note, we'd love to hear from you. If you have thoughts, questions or perhaps a topic you'd like us to cover in future episodes, please do email them over to the bod at craniumgroup.com. Now, with all of that said and done, let's get today's episode on the road. Today, we are looking into the world of digital, specifically transformation and innovation. In the age of COVID-19, organisations that had yet to invest in digital transformation found themselves scrambling to catch up with their digitally enabled competitors. As a result, most, if not all, organisations are now on their way to digitalising business critical processes, workflows and client facing operations. In this episode, we ask what have been the lessons learned from the events of 2020? How did the pandemic enable transformation to occur faster than in usual times? What challenges are still being worked through? And what can data and analytics leaders be doing today to capitalise on the new appetite for digitalisation in the business community? Now, today I am joined by three brilliant thought leaders. Now, joining me first in the studio is Ordnance Survey's Head of Data Analytics Services, Lisa Allen. Now, Lisa recently appeared within one of our Business of Data podcast episodes, so I'm very excited that I'm able to chat with her again today, all about digital. Lisa, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so excited to be able to chat to you further after our lovely podcast episode the other day. Yes, great to be here. Fantastic. Now, Lisa, I'm going to dive straight into my first question here. In a recent study we conducted, 60% of data analytics leaders said they saw a demand for data in their organisation rise due to COVID-19. Now, I know from our previous conversations that you've been doing some wonderful work and really interesting work within the Ordnance Survey to help fight against COVID. But how did you deal with that surge in the demand for data? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, well, for us, we're geared up for such emergencies. So um, our response, I would say, was split into three areas. So first of all, we've got a public sector geospatial agreement, which is our contract to supply geospatial and data and services to government. And in that is something called a mapping for emergencies. So it's a free service that we um, support the resilience community with. So these are CAT 1 and CAT 2 responders. Mm -hmm. So they're like your emergency services, your local authorities, the NHS, health and safety executive. And that means we're available 24 hours in an emergency. So we've been supporting them with their response. Um, so, so far under this agreement, we've responded to about 160 hours. Um, do you want me to go into what those are? Yes, absolutely. Please do. Yeah. So it means we've been providing some like basic maps and plotting of data. We've been doing data matching, which has been especially important for um, like the addressing during pandemic to ensure the letters went out to the vulnerable. We've also been supplying data on points of interest like customers, um, as well as customers like on care homes or supermarkets. And we've had specific asks for data, you know, um, for example, identification of a high, hard standard which met a certain criteria or other requests like how many pharmacies there are or what's the certain distance of supermarkets. So there's all sorts of things we've been doing on the data response. Um, should I go into some of the analytical response we've been doing too? Yeah, that would be fantastic. So yeah, so we're on the analytical side of things. We're, yes, yeah, excellent. So on the analytical side, we've been doing things with other um, organisations like the Office of National Statistics. Um, so we've had our data scientists did some work looking at access to green spaces, and that's been really important during this time when we've all been locked up, really. So um, we've been working with them. We've got something called address-based product, which has 29 million residential addresses in and um, we've been using our data on our unique property references and our, our green spaces, which is about parks and gardens. And some of the interesting facts that came out of that is that um, older people 
people um, were among most likely to have access to um, outside space. And um, I'm just trying to find my facts now. Sorry. Um, and so, yeah, so, so just eight percent of people over 65 um, didn't have access to a, um, a private outdoor garden. And more than a quarter of people, about 28 percent in Great Britain, live within a five minute walk um, to somewhere, a green space or a public park. Well, about 72% live fewer than 15 minutes away. So I think, I don't know about you, but for me, getting outside during this pandemic has been really key for me. Yeah. And so the, so the last area I think we've had to really adapt is about how we supply our data. So there's been lots of private companies supplying um, government or working with government with the response. You know, it's not just been a government response. It's been a whole country response, hasn't it? So um, we've adapted our licenses, actually, because at the moment that public sector geospatial agreement um, covers the um, government. So we've adapted when we've ended up doing a COVID license to make sure we can, um, those private companies can work with the government to, to help in that response. So, so we don't miss on that opportunity. Yeah, so it's been, it's been a busy time, but I don't, for us, business as usual hasn't stopped either. So um, for us, we've had in the office, we've had them doing data improvements and things like that. So we've made something like 500 improvements to our water network, which is all the rivers. And we've also made improvements to like naming of thousands of, um, of construction sites and things like that. So we haven't wasted that time either. So yeah, it's been a really busy time. A really busy time, I feel like, is the understatement of the century, but uh, brilliant to hear so. Now, Lisa, just before I let you go today, uh, obviously the, the whole episode here is about digital, and as we, we've spoken before, 200-year-old legacy is, is what you're, you're dealing with, and, I, and I'd love for you to be able to answer for the audience what you have been doing to overcome the challenges of when analogue meets digital. Yeah, that's another great question i think os has always been evolving um i mean we wouldn't be here if we didn't evolve i mean 200 years old is um definitely an old organization so i think because we manage um location data for um, great britain i mean we make some like 20,000 changes a day to a database that contains 500 mil million geographical features that's anything from buildings roads or care homes you know covering england and scotland and wales so actually we we've, we've had to evolve quite early on and one of our values is um to Stay ahead and um, we digitized a lot of our maps uh, many years ago I think before many were even considering it but today we're really looking at how our customer needs are changing so we're looking at their requirements and um, I think in the past people have really thought about maps for, for a person but actually where we are now changing is it's a lot more machine to machine so we need to transform our data to fit into that new environment so I think for us it's about ensuring that our features can stand alone so when I talk about features I might be talking like a, about a river and if you're thinking about it for a map, then actually you'll have a bridge that could go over the top of it. And that means if you pull it out as data alone, then the river would have gaps in it, which is no good if you just want to know where the flow of the river's going. So for us, we're looking at that cartographic legacy that we've got and really that change in use case from those, um, you know, from, from people looking at it to how it actually fits now into that analytical ecosystem and that wider ecosystem. So yeah, we're doing lots of things like that. And we're also changing how we serve our data too. So we um, launched a new data hub in July, which means you can get access to our data um, through APIs. And um, we've also introduced um, a free to a threshold for some of our data products. So that means you can access it up to a certain limit for free. And then after that, you pay. So we've been changing how we're doing the business model too. There's quite a lot we've been doing in that space, really, making sure we're really evolving to stay current yeah. because that's important for over a 200-year-old company. Brilliant. And I mean, absolutely, constantly looking to see how you can innovate and transform is certainly uh, of importance. Lisa, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you for having me. Brilliant. Now, joining me next to keep this exciting conversation going is one of my favourite thought leaders, and I know you all love hearing from him as well. Please join me in welcoming Russell Barker, who is the Global Head of Macro Transport, Morgan Stanley. Thanks, Catherine. Hi, Thanks. Russell. How are you doing? Yeah, really well, thank you. Brilliant. So let's let's jump straight into these questions. And, and the, I'm going to ask you quite a challenging one first, because, Russell, I'd love to know what is the biggest one challenge that you've had to overcome when it comes to digital transformation? Thanks, Catherine. Well, yeah, as you know, we're kind of going through a huge process at the moment of really changing the way we use data across our things, fixed income business. I think by far for us, the biggest challenge has been the sheer scope of the project. Um, across the fixed income department, there are a huge number of databases 
ranging across time series data, structured data, relational data, from the very high volume data we use in the e-business to the very complex bespoke data we use in the structured products group. Also, the users of data have a huge range of needs. The pricing analytics of the trading desks, the client analysis and reports of the sales team, um, the risk and market impact used by the risk managers, the volume and flow information reported to the CEO team, to name just a few. I'm going to build a single consistent data framework across the whole department, encompassing all these diverse data sources that could be used to satisfy the needs of the entire user base. Uh, so to do this, we spent a long time talking to people about their data uses and issues, all the way from very senior management to the individual salespeople, traders, risk managers, and our partners in finance. Doing this, we kind of identified some common themes. Uh, the first one being the ability to discover data, what data is available. With a large number of individualistic sources, it can be very hard for people to know where to look for data and which source to use. Access to data is another one. Once again, where they had a huge number of different systems, um, access to which can be require very specialist knowledge. Next was data quality. It's obviously very important for people to be able to trust the data they use. And finally, data controls, which is kind of becoming more and more a big issue. People want to know what they can do with data, who they can share it with, what are the rules and regs around it. Absolutely. So we started by... Oh, sorry. No, we carry on. By, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we started by giving users a single place where they could search for data with access to consistent metadata sets. So like, metadata was kind of key to our strategy by recording... Um, good metadata and keeping that consistent, we are able to record things like the quality of the data, the update frequency, the original source of the data, subsequent lineage, how much historical data is available, and any usage restrictions. This allows people to know what they can do with the data, what's there, and how confident they can be to use it. On top of this, we built a single entry point across all of the data. So once users had discovered what data was available, they could get access to it without having to know the intricacies of the underlying system. Um, and finally, we gave people a single place where they could not only access data, but also access the firm's internal analytics and get access to a whole suite of data analytics and machine learning tools, and then easily publish any tooling analysis they built on top of this. In tangent to that, we also worked on data quality. So providing a single hub for all data quality controls where people can go and see the status of any fixed income data and request new data quality controls and reports on this data. And as part of this, we worked across a number of different departments trying to ensure that the best practice we were putting in place in the fixed income business was coordinated across the bank and ensuring all can access our data discovery meta metadata. And we also worked with senior people across the company to construct a data control framework around issues such as data ownership, data accessibility, sharing data, data, data sourcing. So as I'm sure you can imagine, a transformation of this scale comes with a fair share of challenges, not just technical challenges, but also challenges that arise from working with such a diverse user base. In fact, if I was going to give you one takeaway from all of this, we found really the best way to meet these challenges is to engage with stakeholders as early as possible and get them to feel not just a sense of ownership, but also a sense of genuine excitement about the project. And I think that's that's completely valid. And what, what you said there uh, during your answer, I think is the, is the issue of managing passion because you get very excited people. They want to be data driven now. I think that's less and less of a concern for many companies. It's no longer let's be data driven, but actually managing that because you want people to be accessing quality data. You want them to be accessing it from a source of truth that you trust and, and can use properly. So actually, I think what's really interesting about your answer there is, is that passion management to make sure everyone is uh, singing from the same hymn sheet, as they say. And, uh, and Russell, a kind of follow up question then, as, as you mentioned, stakeholders there is whenever there is a new adoption of technology or process, I think change is scary and it's scary to us all. And there can be a level of pushback, uh, not, not always necessarily founded in fear, but perhaps they, they have experience in these areas. So how do you manage that resistance, whether that be from the stakeholders or perhaps the wider business? Well, that's an excellent point. I mean, in our case, we were very lucky to have buy-in right from the start from the very highest levels of management. However, in general, I think when starting a project at this scale, it's really important to look at, you know, what might make people resistant. Like from an executive point of view, there are several things that can lead to pushback. The main ones we found being the possible disruption to the business, the levels of complexity involved, 
And finally, though definitely not least, the cost. Uh, in order to address the first two, we talked to our senior stakeholders to understand their vision for the business as a whole and put together a plan based around this, tying in what we wanted to do with our data strategy with their wider business plans. So we started by identifying several key areas where they wanted to grow the business. We worked with people in those areas to find out how, you know, if we got better data access and better data analytics, how could this help grow the business? Um, and we based our data journey around these key business deliverables. So by tying our strategy to something very concrete deliverables, we managed to frame it not as an invasive change, but a, as a key component of the wider business strategy. This also helped around the issue of cost. Um, working with these people in sales and trading, we put together proposals for how better coordinated use of data and better analytics could help drive revenue. We were able to show that with only a small number of projects, um, the example increase in revenue would soon actually repay the cost of the program. So this helped alleviate a lot of the senior stakeholder concern. However, it's worth remembering the pushback doesn't just come from the top. A lot of resistance can come from the people on the desk. People can see these issues like data strategy as very high level and likely to be very disruptive to their day-to-day -day working environment. So this is where our strategy of talking to a lot of individual stakeholders really paid off. I think it really helped that my team sits on the trading floor uh, directly with our clients. And so they really know their, how their business works and what their needs are. As I said, we worked with a number of traders and salespeople from across the business to come up with a set of data tooling and analysis requirements that would help them directly. We then built a new framework around providing these. This way, we very quickly um, provided tangible benefits to the trading and sales desks. So they could see the data strategy. It wasn't an abstract policy being forced upon them, but it was actually a set of tools they could use to generate more business and was directly driven by their needs. And this positive feedback from the desks, kind of, as soon as this filtered up to the senior stakeholders, this gave them reassurance that what we were delivering was genuine value. And this helped smooth the way for kind of further resourcing requests in the future. Yeah. I think the real point here is like to understand why people may be resistant to change and show that not only have you listened to their concerns, but you're using what they tell you um, to help drive the project for their benefit. That's kind of the real way to win hearts and minds. Fantastic. I mean, for, for me, the three key takeaways from that that, that I've de definitely taken from that answer from, from you, Russell, is one, predict where the scary parts might be and have answers for those. Two, speak the language if it's a case that someone needs to hear the money they're going to save and that's how it's going to work. And then three, just being very transparent and open and making sure that you have that conversation. And it's not just a case of going in and saying this is how it's going to work, but allowing those uh, opinions to arise. Russell, thank you so much for joining me today. I'll chat to you soon. Thank you, Catherine. Cheers. Bye. Wow, we and finally joining me to round off what has been a brilliant conversation from AXA Health, we have Nina Moncton, who is the head of strategy. Hi, Hello. Nina. How are you doing? I'm OK, thank you. I am um, brilliant. Yeah. Good. <laughs> so let's dive straight into this uh, this conversation here. So in a recent study that we conducted, 59% of our respondents said that they provided their company leadership with analytics and reports on the impact of COVID-19. I mean, fr from my perspective, it's great to see so many leaders are latching on to data analytics, but how should they maintain that close relationship with key stakeholders and businesses going forward? Uh, I think for me, this is more about how does the organisation as a whole align data with its business strategy and, and value and business value. So really, I think um, what, what, what should be happening in, a, in an ideal situation is that your, your business strategy, the way that the organisation is run, um, and the values of the organization are taking into account how data and digital can support those objectives as to what you're trying to achieve. Um, and that for me is, is where the link happens. And if that, if that is clear, um, then it, it, it really helps the business to engage with, with data and what it can deliver. I think another thing that is really important is um, 
and and there's been plenty of research done on this to to to, to say that this is the case. But where you have um, somebody within the exec team who is sponsoring data or who is um, actually a, a data expert, it tends to it tends to make things easier. So that translation as to what the business is trying to do and how data and, and digital can help achieve that, it, it, it becomes a bit more oiled, I suppose. Um, I think another thing that, that is worth considering is do, do you have the right organisational structure? <clears throat> and I think that's really critical. Um, and I, I think along with, you know, is there someone on the exec team who's championed this data? It, it is a bit about how is the data team structured? So um, I was on a, a, a discussion last week with peers from across industry and we, we got onto this subject and um, it was it was really fascinating. But I think the, the um, overwhelming... Um, feedback was actually having a, a central team is is not the way, way forward because although it gives um, that sense of community for your, your data scientists and your data engineers, um, <clears throat> what it, it potentially can do is, is create a bit of a, um, a disjoint between um, the data team and, and the rest of the business. So there was certainly something to be said for um, how we structure our data teams so that they are embedded within the business, but not left um, within the business without their their data community around them. So, and I, and I think that's a really interesting challenge, actually. And I'd, I'd, I'm not sure that any, certainly nobody on the call had, had absolutely cracked it because there are a, a obviously pros and cons with with each way. But certainly there's a an overwhelming sort of feeling coming that that this sort of more hybrid approach to a bit central and 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 some things happening within business units is is the way to to move forward but um and i think another thing is is finding um champions within the business there's nothing more powerful um than you know somebody from within the business talking about how um, analytics has helped their team to be more efficient or to make better decisions. Um, that that's really one of the ways to to really engage with the rest of the business because then they hear that and and um, they want a bit of it as well. So uh, I think that's that's probably all I've got to say on that <laughs> one. Super. I mean, what better way to sell your story than to have? champions as you say giving case studies i mean it means you can sit there and say well yeah this is what we do and they can really translate that into a language that that they understand and they value as as well so nina i'm keen to know what digital transformations does axa have on its horizon over the next year uh, well I, like all <laughs> organizations i would suggest at the moment um one of the things that, that we are thinking about very much is workforce and workplace um, and AXA Health is is really thinking about uh, a post-COVID progressive smart working solution so obviously that requires sorry requires um, new capabilities technologies processes um, and and it's it's more than you know, simply carry on working at home and, and maybe come into the office a couple of times a week. So um, I, I think that's that's probably one of the biggest things that we're looking at at the moment. And and also, um, I just thought a lot of organisations are, are looking at this and, and how we how we future work. COVID has, if nothing else, accelerated um, the notion of the traditional being in the office, hasn't it? Um, and then I suppose the other thing we're looking at is is big data and how and how we use it to customise products, um, reevaluate pricing and underwriting, um, and also because we're a, a health company, obviously we're very very interested in um, making sure that we're um, doing the best, the absolute best, and and um, Center of excellence in things like data privacy, um, security, uh, but also we're 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 an organisation. We're not just a health insurer. We also provide um, wellbeing services. So the the really exciting thing about the technology and and big data and what you can do with it for us is about um, 
how we can support people to be healthy rather than um, simply looking at what, what happens once somebody needs some intervention. So um, that, that's really interesting and in how, how we might start using um, wearables and sensors to, to support people um, to live healthy lives. Uh, and I think as well, digital is really going to help with the personali personalization. That's, that's a standard thing. That's what everybody's really looking at. Um, <clears throat> but that personalization from a pricing and uh, experience perspective. And then I guess the other thing that is, is what, again, everyone's looking at is, is how we make processes more efficient and, and actually more robust. Um, so using data and AI to, to, to improve, not, not just do the job, but also improve the data that we're collecting, because that in turn means we can do better things with the data, but also have that deeper understanding of, um, of our customers and, and how they're using our services and, and what they, where, they're, where they're struggling with, with using our services and we can make things better for them. Super. Well, that sounds like an exciting, fully packed 12 months. So I'll, I'll definitely book you in for a conversation this time next year and we'll see where you are and, uh, and where you're going next. Nina, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thanks. How we get through so much content in such a short space of time, I will never know. But what I really found of interest was how fast these executives have moved in their digital transformation journey and just how much they've got planned for the future as well. So thank you again to all of our brilliant thought leaders for their contributions. Now, next time, we'll be talking all about leading a data-driven COVID-19 recovery, just as we have done this time. We'll be joined by expert thought leaders to help us dive deep into the challenges and opportunities. Be sure to subscribe to our Business of Data YouTube channel. Follow us on our page on LinkedIn. And of course, come and visit us at the Business of Data platform as well for more great content, insights and connections. As always, stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you next time.